Hi, wonderful to see everybody. It's uh, great to be here at the uh, the cabinet retreat and be able to answer a couple of questions uh, with relation to health. Uh, I can say just quickly uh, with respect to uh, the bilateral agreements uh, that uh, we're making really great progress. Uh, the latest one, of course, was uh, to announce Alberta just before the uh, the Christmas break. Uh, and of course, British Columbia, Nova Scotia and PEI are also announced. And you can see from the quality of those agreements, uh, really a lot of work has gone in to collaborate with provinces to tackle issues around uh, health workforce, around backlogs, around making sure that Canadians have access to uh, a family doctor. And I think it's uh, really important to be able to demonstrate that while well, um, uh, we may not agree on, on everything, that on health it's so important that we all pull in the same direction and we find common ground. Uh, we've just uh, reached an agreement with Northwest Territories. I will be up to Northwest Territories to announce that in person, uh, and we'll have several others. So between now and the end of March, uh, I'll be uh, seeing the, the, the fruits of all of that work uh, materializing in the form of announcements uh, across the country at the same time that we're getting ready to, uh, to roll out a dental. But really my purpose here today was to take any questions that uh, you might have related to health. Mr. Hall, I wanted to ask you about May. With the March deadline coming up, how close are you to decide whether to expand to include mental health or to postpone further? Uh, well, we really appreciate the work of the uh, the Joint Committee uh, that uh, its findings are going to be reported next week. Uh, I think it's appropriate that we wait to, uh, to see the conclusions of that, that committee's work. But let me be clear, uh, in talking with health ministers across the country, there have been concerns about readiness. Um, there is no question in my mind that, uh, that equivalency exists between uh, physical and mental suffering. Uh, but by the same token, we have to make sure our system is ready. Uh, so I'll be looking forward to next week the, uh, the report that will come from the Joint Committee on that question. And uh, we'll be obviously needing to take action immediately thereafter. In the meeting with your FDA, so your counterparts in the United States about the FDA decision on Florida, do you think there's any scenario in which Canadian medicine does in fact get exported to the United States? Well, there's 100% a scenario under which Canadian medicine gets exported to the United States. It happens all the time. It's okay when it doesn't uh, endanger our domestic drug supply. So, you know, the, I had a very good conversation with uh, Secretary Becerra uh, and with Ambassador Cohen. Uh, saying that uh, you know we want to work collaboratively with the United States. In fact, expanding our ability to sell pharmaceuticals to the United States is is advantageous to us, and we want to work with the United States uh, not only on uh, our challenges with pharmaceuticals, both in terms of price and availability, uh, but with theirs and with other G G7 countries. But that can never come at risk of uh, of, of uh, endangering the domestic supply of drugs in Canada. Uh, and I can say uh, unequivocally uh, that in my conversation with both Ambassador Cohen and Secretary Becerra that they were exceptionally supportive of that. They acknowledged uh, the need for us to work in collaboration and to make sure that Canadian drugs are not endangered. Oui, c'est pas avec euh, le Québec, pas encore, pas, pas encore. C'est 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 euh, c'est une question de, de de continuer de la conversation. Et parce que c'est pas une question de juridiction, pas du tout. Euh, c'est avec euh, l'Alberta, par exemple. Il y a il y a beaucoup de de inquiète sur les questions de juridiction avec l'Alberta, mais c'était pas un problème de créer une attente parce que c'est essentiel de s'assurer que le donné est là. Alors pour le, le peuple, pour les Québécois, les Québécois, mais même si pour toutes les personnes partout au pays, de voir l'action. De, 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 de voir dans le donné le progrès euh, dans une certaine province euh, en contraste d'une autre. Et, et à mon avis, ça c'est euh, vraiment raisonnable. Si le gouvernement est là avec l'argent, et il y a des conditions là, et les conditions est de, 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 de montrer que l'argent est, euh, est utilisé dans une bonne façon d'augmenter le système de santé. Et je suis certain que c'est possible avec le gouvernement de Québec hein, de, de trouver une attente. Il y, a, il y a quelques mois de plus, euh, deux mois de plus, et euh, j'avais une bonne conversation avec le ministre Dubé. Et, euh, et je n'ai pas un problème avec toutes les autres provinces, mais c'est seulement avec Québec. Mais euh, dans la conversation avec le ministre Dubé, euh, il est quelqu'un tellement raisonnable. Et notre euh, euh, attente est, euh, avec euh, notre, notre euh, demande pardon, est, est tellement raisonnable. Et ça, c'est la raison pour laquelle 
euh, je pense que euh, une, une étente est possible. Mais c'est quoi les conditions? Vous dites qu'il y a des conditions. C'est quoi les conditions que vous, vous voulez et que eux, ils veulent rien savoir? Mais c'est, c'est, c'est dans notre système euh, de santé. Euh, c'est, c'est les personnes, les qualités de santé qui est la chose qui est importante. Ce n'est pas les juridictions. La personne est tannée avec ça. C'est, c'est, oh, il y a une partie là, une position d'une certaine partie, ou c'est un type de juridiction. Non, pas ça, pas du tout. Les personnes sont tannées, tannées avec ça. C'est une question de qualité de santé et d'augmenter la qualité de santé, de s'assurer que la le, le, le santé est disponible publiquement pour chaque personne partout au pays. Et si le gouvernement va donner l'argent au Québec, les personnes au Québec euh, veulent que les, les données sont là, de, de, de montrer que l'augmentation est là et de voir la différence euh, euh, contre les autres provinces. Et ça, c'est raisonnable. Et, et ça, c'est la raison pour laquelle je suis certain que c'est possible de trouver une attente. Well, look, when, when things are difficult around the world, you know, and you, you, can only, you can look back at any other historical example, people who run around with slogans telling you how easy it is, all you got to do is snap your fingers and fix problems. Well, if that was so easy, tell me a country that's, that's, that's got it fixed on that basis. Uh, there's been many countries that have uh, tried going to simple solutions and slogans. It's been a disaster, right? There's one way forward, just as there always has been. Uh, which is that we've got to do a lot of hard work and thinking and have complex conversations that are uncomfortable and be honest with each other about where we are. The world is in a period of enormous transition. There is enormous geopolitical uncertainty. You know, one of the big problems that we have with costs is just the ability to move goods and services around the world with as much geopolitical uncertainty as there is. So pretending that there are simple solutions is dishonest. And so I believe in a tipping point. I believe if you have enough honest, hard conversations with people. You know, when I was in Durham region knocking on doors, we have a by-election coming up there. And sure, when you talk to people at first, they say, I'm frustrated, I'm upset. You know, Polyev is saying all we have to do is change one thing, you know, get rid of a price on pollution, everything's fixed. And you go, you know that's not true. You know what he's saying is just trying to hold a mirror to your frustrations and amp you up and pretend a simple solution is there. I have great faith in this country and in our democracy and the ability of us to have mature conversations. If Mr. Polyev is going to take his circus show into the election and pretend that his, you know, the, the, the animals and, and flaming hoops that he's whipping around are actual solutions to what's happening in the world, when rubber hits road and people actually making decisions sit in their, in their kitchen tables and talk about the problems in the world and hear his oversimplistic Partisan nonsense? I'm extremely confident in the decision Canadians will make. Last question. Premièrement, sur les questions de pharmacare. Uh, so we're having, uh, continue to have good conversations. You know, this is not an easy issue. I came into this position uh, five and a half months ago. Um, and I have to say that uh, my conversation with all parliamentarians, but particularly with New Democrats, has been very pos- positive. Uh, we have to recognize we're in a restrained fiscal environment, uh, and so that some of the ambition has to be tempered by that. Uh, but those conversations have been very productive. Uh, we've set a new date of March 1st, uh, and, uh, and, I, and I am confident that we're going to be able to meet that new date. Have you been able to attacking the actual prices? I mean, there was an entire plan performed by one of your predecessors to tackle prices at the industry level. <coughs> Just abandon that entirely at this point? No, not at all. In fact, when you look at bulk purchasing, uh, we've been able to save consumers hundreds of millions of dollars in Canada alone. And, and because of that bulk purchasing, it's why Canada has such an advantageous position uh, vis-a-vis the United States. In fact, the United States is trying to uh, uh, take our drugs because we have uh, better pricing. Um, so we actually have done a enormous amount that has created an enviable position. That's why we're having the conversation that we're having about having to protect it. But much more can be done. And you know, when I'm talking to industry about how we can work collaboratively to do that, I think some of it can be done in legislation, some of it can be done um, through working with industry. But it's extremely important, I think, to look at ways 
you know, just as we have with childcare, how that reduces people's costs in a, in a globe where prices are going up. When we're looking at dental care, which is rolling up, making sure that people don't wind up in an emergency situation where they're into catastrophic costs around their dental care. This sort of thing makes a huge, real, appreciable difference in a globe, in a, in a, uh, in a, in a globe of increasing, or in a world of increasing prices. And certainly, I think with pharmaceuticals, there's a lot we can do as well. Um, is there anything you can point to right now that makes you more optimistic um, about getting a deal done by March 1st that wasn't in place previously? Like, what's different now? Well, I think that, you know, one of the things that I uh, really am encouraged by is the, the work that we've done on dental. And if I can just point to that as an example. Uh, you know, I think there was a lot of questions, including in my own mind, in a minority government, uh, and at the time I was the House leader, how are we going to work with a different party that we disagree with so much to find a path forward? Uh, and the thing that I have to say about the NDP is they've been focused on solutions. Uh, and I think that's what Canadians want. And so, yes, we're having hard conversations, but those conversations are rooted in reality, and they're not about how do I extract some partisan gain or how do I score a point. It's about how do we help people in a really difficult time. And I have to say the pharmacare conversation has been really rooted in the same place. So I watch the Conservatives whose sole preoccupation is political points and making YouTube videos that are uh, you know, over the top partisan in nature and offering no solutions. And I have to say the NDP has been very constructive. Uh, and, on that, and, th and that's really been the frame of our conversations around pharmacare. So I look forward to being able to say more. It's a bit frustrating for me because you know, there is, I, I would like to be able to say more, but we're still in a, in, in a phase of negotiation. <laughs> Deadline mean anything? They, Does this new deadline mean anything? The last one clearly didn't. Like, isn't this all arbitrary to a certain degree? Well, sure, sure. I mean, but look, the, the the point here is to get it right. You know, I mean, I don't. I, I'm not a clairvoyant. You know, I lack a crystal ball. I don't have a direct. You know, I, I don't have a, a direct line to a psychic that is reliable. So what that means is that we have to take our best guess as to where that negotiation will end. And they're a different political party. Right? I mean, they have completely different views on things. So it, it is a very complicated process to get to an agreement. So what we do is make a best guess based on the, the pace of our negotiations of where we think we can get to. Uh, based on the conversations that I'm having, I think that date's reasonable. But I'm not alone in controlling that. There's a lot of other factors, and they're a completely different party. But based on the pace of negotiations, yes, I think that's possible. Last question, last question. Sorry, yes. I know there was draft legislation. I have to say that myself, otherwise, yeah. I agree with you. draft legislation last fall. Have you guys presented them with another version of that bill yet? Oh, sure. There's lots of stuff back and forth. You know, I mean, there's, this is a iterative, ongoing conversation uh, where, you know, we're saying, what about this? They're saying, what about that? And there's back, and there's lots of back and forth. It's a very dynamic, active conversation. And by the way, I mean, you know, going back to my previous role as House Leader, it's dynamic within the, the overall conversation about everything that's happening in Parliament as well. Because, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's important for us to have a clear idea about how all of these things fit in with all of the other conversations we're having. Thank Thanks so much. Okay. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, on a déjà eu des excellentes conversations. Uh, on est très ciblé sur les enjeux qui sont les plus importants pour les Canadiens et Canadiennes. La classe moyenne, le logement, les bons emplois pour les Canadiens, la portabilité. So we have already had a really rich, important discussion at this cabinet retreat. We've been focusing on the issues that matter most to Canadians, to people in the middle class, people working hard to join the middle class. We've been focused on housing. We've been focused on the cost of living. We've been focused on economic growth that delivers those good jobs that are the basis for a good life. We had a really good conversation about jobs in the Canadian economy, more than nearly a million jobs more than we had before COVID first hit. We've spoken about inflation down in December to 3.4% from a high of 8.1%. And wages have now been rising faster than inflation for 11 months in a row. We've talked about economic growth and ensuring we have the investments to drive growth, create good jobs. Foreign direct investment in the, past, in the first six months of 2023, Canada was the third most popular foreign FDI destination in the world. 
and that is on a gross basis. Per capita, more FDI to Canada in the first six months of 2023 than to any other G7 country. And we talked about the work our government is doing, delivering on our economic plan. A lot of focus on housing, um, focus on the apartment loan construction program, which is on track to get 100,000 more apartments built. A lot of us visited some of those construction sites and saw those new homes that Canadians will live in. We talked about the Housing Accelerator Fund that is on track to deliver 300,000 new homes. We talked about the tax-free first home savings account. Last week, I announced that there are now more than 500,000 tax-free first home savings account. That's really important because what that shows is the dream of buying your first home is alive and well, and Canadians are investing in that dream. We talked a lot about early learning and childcare, uh, what a driver that is of labor force participation. You see now a big gap between Canada and the US when it comes to women of working age participating in the labor force. That is creating supply, driving growth, and making life better for families. And we spoke about our industrial policy, the investment tax credits, the Canada Growth Fund, which concluded its first contract for difference at the end of last year, and the ways that that is a driver of investments in Canada and jobs for today and for the future. Et maintenant, on est prêt à répondre à vos questions. Je suis tellement content d'être ici avec ma chère collègue, notre ministre pour les petites et moyennes entreprises, Madame Valdez. Clarify how many businesses have paid back SIBA loans with their own money versus through refinancing through banks. Can we get that separated number rather than the global number? So I'm going to let our Minister for Small Business start with the reply and then I'll follow in as desired. Richie, to you. For sure. Thanks for the question. Uh, before I answer that, I just want to say thank you to all the small businesses who did the right thing to keep Canadians safe and then continue to remain resilient and to persevere through some very challenging times. Um, with that, I can answer that uh, small businesses have been able to um, approximately, or est we've estimated about 75% have been able to pay back. And how many um, of that was refinanced through banks? And how many of that paid back the loan themselves? Uh, we, as soon as we were able to finalize some of those numbers, we'll be sure to be able to share that, including the breakdown between the two. Okay, so you don't have it right now? Not at this time, thank you. Okay, thank you. So, so, you Mr. Minister, does your government have a delivery problem? Um, over the years, there's been a lot of money put on the table, Canadian Infrastructure Bank, Housing Accelerator. It's not always gone out the door efficiently. It's not always gone out the door. It's not always been spent. It's not always been tracked. Do you have a delivery problem? And if so, how do you fix it? Okay, well, let's talk about the Canada Growth Fund, which we announced in the 2022 budget. And we already now have had the first major investment by the Canada Growth Fund, and then the first contract for difference delivered by the Canada Growth Fund, both of those this fall. That is really, really fast action. That is complicated. The Canada Growth Fund contract for difference that we announced an investment in entropy in Calgary, that is the first contract for difference on a carbon price of its kind. It is up and running. It is happening in Canada. It is not happening anywhere else in the world. And let's talk about the Housing Accelerator Fund. Again, really, really complicated. And that is now up and running. We have deals we are announcing every single week, a new deal with a new municipality. We've announced deals with the biggest cities across the country. And that is on track to deliver hundreds of thousands of homes for Canadians. And I actually misspoke on the Canada Growth Fund because that was actually first announced in the 2023 budget. And it is already delivering investments in Canada. That's a big deal. Et concernant le logement, um, pour le logement, on a une entente avec la province du Québec. C'est une excellente entente. On apprécie aussi les investissements que la province a fait dans le logement avec le fédéral. 
Et on est en train de livrer la marchandise en ce qui concerne la construction du logement. Madame Brunet, sur les États-Unis, c'est vous qui étiez au front dans, il y a plusieurs années, lorsqu'il a fallu renégocier l'ALENA. Au jour d'aujourd'hui, quand vous regardez les élections qui s'en viennent en novembre, qu'est-ce qui vous fait le plus peur d'une élection avec Donald Trump? Alors, euh, on a travaillé en équipe. C'était vraiment un travail d'équipe de notre gouvernement, euh, mais plus que ça. C'était du travail de l'équipe du Canada. Et c'est quand nous travaillons ensemble qu'on a des réussites. On a démontré cela et je suis absolument convaincue qu'on pourra le faire dans l'avenir. We absolutely recognize that inflation has been a real challenge for Canadians, and I think all of us are glad to see inflation has come down from its peak of 8.1% down to 3.4% in December. I think all Canadians also recognize the challenge that high interest rates are posing. As inflation comes down, that is something that we want to support because we do see interest rates are posing a challenge for Canadians. How do you miss Mr. Right, so, okay, can you just, I, I, I didn't actually hear a clear answer on whether you think that interest rates are one of the key drivers of housing unaffordability right now? One of Canada's fundamental strengths is the strength of our institutions. And actually, that has been recognized in the recent reports of ratings agencies that have reaffirmed our AAA rating. And as part of that reaffirmation, they have, spoke, they have talked about the strength of Canada's institutions, which is a distinguishing factor in the world right now. One of our core economic institutions is that we have an independent central bank that independently sets interest rates. We recognize that. But if interest rates won't, interest rates, as, as I understand from economists, them being up won't actually alleviate house prices because it's a supply issue that are driving house prices up. But they are contributing to house prices being even more unaffordable. Do you believe that having a high interest rate environment is still necessary, given that in other areas of the economy we're seeing deflation? We all absolutely recognize the challenge that high inflation has posed for Canadians. And I think all of us in our professional capacities and just as human beings are glad to see that inflation has come down from its peak of 8.1% to 3.4% in December. That is a relief for Canadians. It is really important. Our government has been and is committed to supporting the Bank of Canada in the work of ensuring that inflation can come down so that interest rates can come down as well. Because we do recognize, as does every single Canadian, that high interest rates are a challenge. They're a challenge for a business looking to invest. They're a challenge for a home builder looking to build more homes. They're a challenge for a young Canadian looking to buy a first home. And I think that's really elementary and obvious to all Canadians. This is the third cabinet retreat, at least in a row, where you've said that affordability and housing prices and inflation are sort of your key topics of conversation. A year, a year later, at least, with three cabinet retreats, Canadians don't seem to be buying whatever message you're selling on it. Why are Canadians not believing that your government has the solutions? Last question. Um, you're right. This has been an incredibly challenging economic period. And it's one of the things we've spoken about. And I think all of us need to step back a little bit and look at the economic roller coaster our country and all of us have been through since COVID first hit. 
This is now nearly four years ago, right? So COVID hit beginning of 2020 and we shut down our economy really for the first time in world history. And we were thrown into the deepest recession since the Great Depression. Think back to our predictions then. Think back to the fears, legitimate fears we all had of deep economic scarring of the pain you would get from prolonged unemployment. That was shock number one. Then you had shock number two, which was the shock of the reopening of our economy and we had all of the supply chain challenges in the world because it wasn't only our economy being reopened it was the global economy and that was exacerbated by Putin's illegal invasion of Ukraine adding an energy shock to that as a result of these supply chain shocks of the energy shock we had high inflation and then the next shoe to drop I guess I have more shocks than I have shoes um, but uh, the next wave to hit was then high interest rates in response to high inflation. So I don't think it is at all surprising that Canadians are exhausted, that Canadians have economic whiplash. It has been a really hard time and it has been one thing after another, one unprecedented in the lifetime you know, of certainly a person who didn't live through the First World War, one unprecedented shock after another. I think the good news is we are, as a country, working hard to get through those shocks. Inflation, you know, you mentioned inflation, Mia. You know, it was at 8.1% at one of our cabinet retreats. It's now down to 3.4% that is a real meaningful change. We've talked about jobs. I, I still remember so clearly when COVID hit and we had to shut down the economy in order to save lives, what a frightening moment it was for everyone. What fears, you know, whether it was you were worried your business would have to shut down and you would never reopen, whether you worried because you lost your job you'd lose your house, whether at kind of a macro level you worried would Canada recover from this. And so for me, that's why I mentioned like nearly a million jobs more than we had before COVID struck. Go back and read what people were writing in the spring of 2020. And there was no one who predicted that we would be at this level of economic recovery today relative to that shock. So when you ask, uh, you know, have people been through a lot? They have been through so much. And, you know, Rechi quite rightly thanked small businesses um, for the work they did getting through COVID and the work they have done getting through the years follow. So I understand why people are tired and frustrated and our focus is delivering on an economic plan to get through the challenges of today and to deliver on the promise of Canada for Canadians today and tomorrow. Vous expliquez la situation, la COVID, l'invasion russe en Ukraine de long en large, mais sur la solution, vous demandez quoi, vous dites aux Canadiens, un peu de patience, le, le, les hauts taux directeurs vont faire leur effet, puis l'inflation va diminuer, puis après les taux vont diminuer, parce qu'on entend vos grandes explications qui, qui sont intéressantes, mais à côté, il y a un chef du Parti conservateur qui dit, on va congédier le président de la Banque du Canada, puis le problème va être réglé. Ça, ça apparaît attrayant pour plusieurs Canadiens, cette solution-là, à l'heure actuelle. Alors, qu'est-ce que vous leur dites aux Canadiens pour contrer aussi le message conservateur? Okay. Non, merci pour la question. Et c'est vraiment une question importante. Euh, moi, je sais qu'il y a du gros bon sens des Canadiens et Canadiennes. Et je sais que les Canadiens apprécient énormément la stabilité du système politique et économique du Canada que les Canadiens et Canadiennes apprécient énormément la réalité que le Canada est peut-être le pays le plus stable en ce qui concerne notre système 
politique et notre système économique dans le monde entier. Et dans un moment, quand il y a un risque géopolitique, quand il y a d'instabilité partout au monde, le fait qu'on a un pays stable, un pays avec la règle du droit, c'est très, très précieux. Un des éléments de la stabilité canadienne, c'est l'indépendance du Banque du Canada. Ce n'est pas les politiciens, ni l'opposition, ni les politiciens élus qui décident ce que fait le Banque du Canada. Et notre gouvernement comprend cela. Vous avez cité le leader d'opposition. Ma réponse, c'est que c'est très, très dangereux de prendre position comme cela. C'est vraiment un risque, un risque économique, un risque pour la vie quotidienne de monsieur et madame tout le monde. Et le fait qu'il y a des politiciens au Canada qui se permettent de faire les annonces comme cela, ça démontre que ils ne sont pas des gens sérieux. Ils ne sont pas des gens qui pensent vraiment à l'avenir des Canadiens et Canadiennes. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup.